Coming up next is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, where we talk about E3 and the PC, the launch of the OnLive service, and the new Mac Mini. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. It's time for Twitch this week in computer hardware, recorded June 17, 2010, E3 and the PC. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Audible.com. To download a free audiobook of your choice, go to audiblepodcast.com slash twitch. Hi, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Computer Hardware. I am Ryan Shrout, joined remotely again. I guess we're both remote in this <laughs> exact instant uh, by Patrick Norton. How are you doing, Patrick? Hey, I'm good, man. Neither one of us is that close to the mothership. Well, I guess I'm a lot closer to the mothership you are than you are. Significantly closer, <laughs> yes, yes. But thanks to the magics of the interweb, uh, nobody's the wiser, except yes. for that occasional latency and all that other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we had a a fairly interesting week in terms of computer hardware. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit about. Sandy Bridge performance, we will mention. We've got quite a few Twitter questions to go through. New Mac Mini. Uh, I finished an article on GeForce GTX 480 and 470 SLI. We'll talk about but the first thing I wanted to mention. We'll kind of jump into it right away. It seems to be everybody wants to talk about it, is all the stuff that is happening at E3. And how can we kind of relate this to the world of PC gaming uh, and, and, and PC hardware in general? As far as I can tell, I'd be curious, actually, Patrick, have you heard anything really kind of specific to the PC market coming out of E3 at all? Uh, Steam moving on to Mac? No? Was that pre-E3 at all? That was, that was pre-E3. Yeah, there's, there's been so much gaming news in the last two weeks, my skull's kind of bleeding at this point. <laughs> um, okay, Project Natal is now the Kinect. It's 150 bucks. Uh, or as, uh, I think it was Cracked Magazine, which I always go to for my gaming coverage, referred to it as the <laughs> $150 tiger kitten petting simulation. Um, which is really funny. Uh, uh, Penny Penny Arcade, which is one of my favorite gaming comics, did their yes. annual E3 summary of like you know Xbox 360, uh, Nintendo, and then Sony. And we're we're you know harshing out on Sony, which they kind of do whenever they get a chance. Um, but it was kind of like you know Xbox 360. There's a new version. We've got Connect. It's interactive. ESPN goals. And like when people do the score and winning thing, and then it's like you know the the lead of Nintendo, with, you know, going on, you know, being very hip, and they've got the 3D without the glasses, and you know they've right. got the Wii, which is still popular, and then uh, and then of course the head of Sony uh, holding up you know a, a pink lozenge on a stick, and going, no, it's it's not really just a copy of the 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 Wii Mote, we swear. Um, only it's funny and in a cartoon, uh, not the way I said it. I've just not seen. There's certainly a ton of PC games that are coming out, and I personally yeah. think that PC game graphics are starting to seriously spank uh, at mm -hmm. the high end. Certainly, and, and even at the middle, I think are are spanking a lot of the uh, uh, PS3 and Xbox 360 graphics. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, but we're also PC guys. Uh, are you a console gamer, Ryan? And, and I, you know, I, I have Ryan? to. Yeah, I have to admit, I do. <laughs> I play a lot of games on consoles as well. Even sometimes when they're available on both, mostly mm -hmm. because I sit in front of a computer monitor testing testing PC games. You know, for my job. Right. Sometimes <laughs> eight, ten, twelve hours a day, depending on the schedule and that kind of stuff. And every once in a while, it's just nice to be able to sit on the couch and, and pick up the controller and play things. Um, but I, I still prefer the PC. I still prefer mouse and keyboard over controller, especially when we're talking about RTS games or FPS games and that, and that type of thing. Uh, I am curious. We we talked. I we kind of I kind of had a discussion a little bit yesterday about this. The Natal Connect project, mm -hmm. Microsoft. I'm curious whether or not Microsoft will ever enable support for this on Windows, and if so, if any PC game developers would take advantage of it. Um, you're kind of in, I mean, it's kind of like a, a different environment for yeah, well, the, the, console gaming point, versus PC gaming. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, it's I, I don't know if there's any 
uh, official stand inside of Microsoft, but I think they consider Xbox 360 as a lean back living room environment, you know, with wireless right. remote controls and a big HD TV and, and PC gaming is something you do hunched over in a dark corner, at which point, the, <laughs> the, the you know what I mean? Like, at which point over yeah. your keyboard with your mouse. Yeah. Um, it's said it, you know, which is not a very connect friendly kind of environment. So right. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet pretty good money that they are a never going to migrate the connect to that. Uh, mm. uh, you know, call me crazy, but I, I think they're, I think they're going to continue to push the Xbox 360 as their sort of central point sure. for all things living room. Although the windows media center obviously is another point of entry there, but it, you know, isn't semi enthusiastic. And you know, I'll I take it back as enthusiastic as, as Microsoft has been about putting PCs into the living room and attaching them to televisions. They've never really done much on the gaming side there. Yeah. Yeah, their <laughs> their um Windows Live service, Windows what are they called? Games for Windows Live. They I mean it's basically they just kind of gave up on all that kind of stuff. So I I'll be curious. I, I mean, I'm the kind, I I will get a connect. I will try it out. Uh I don't know if I'll get the place the, the Sony Move. I don't really use my PlayStation 3 for anything except for playing back Blu-ray movies. Um, <laughs> which it does very well. Which it does, which yeah, exactly, it does very well. But most of the games I play are available on both systems, and I usually pick Xbox just because that's what most of my friends have. The Nintendo 3DS, the new portable gaming system with the 3D screen, I think is actually pretty compelling, being yeah, as I, it's completely I, I, glassesless and stuff. Yeah, I don't know anybody who who's touched it who hasn't been kind of enthusiastic about it. Really? People, yeah. like, okay, you have to pretty much hold it in in the place to get the effect from the you know, from the 3D technology they're employing, mm -hmm. but there's no goofy glasses, there's no shutter glasses, and it's a Nintendo, you know, it's a Nintendo DS, it's a handheld, which means, you know, there's going to be another generation of kids that are going to latch on to that, and another generation yeah. of adults who are going to take the next step with their favorite characters from Nintendo. I think that's an easy one. What about, uh, what about the uh, PlayStation Move? What do you think of that? Um... I actually, so it, the PlayStation Move kind of takes the Nintendo Wiimote idea and goes a step further. That little lock and ball on the end of it. So the ball is used to uh, better gauge depth to and from the camera as opposed to, so it, it basically uh, gives it another axis of reference for mm -hmm. that, the, that the software can use. Um, so it's more accurate than the Wiimote, even with the Wii Motion Plus, because it has a visual it knows where it is in space, not just where it is in terms of uh, levelness and that kind of thing. It's cheaper. It's only 99 bucks to come with uh, the control or one controller, I'm sure, with the game and everything. I, I haven't seen anything really innovative in, in terms of games for it. Mm -hmm. You know, Microsoft with Kinect showed facial recognition and, and the ability to interact with menus by waving your hands in the air, which was one of those things that technology enthusiasts have always wanted to do. Um, even before the days of uh, whatever that movie was that kind of <laughs> made it all popular, the Tom Cruise flick. But Move, I'm I'm less excited for because it's really, it's nothing really dramatic, dramatically different than what we haven't already seen in the Wii. I mean, it's a little bit different, but not dramatically so. Natal is dramatically different. You know, the whole well, idea of a controllerless interconnection. The Tall may be dramatically different, but if you look at the list of applications that the Wii launched with, and was it 2006? Has it been that long? Uh, yeah. The, the list of applications that the Wii launched with versus the list of applications that the, the Kinetic is, is, is Kinetic Connect Connect. <laughs> <laughs> I want to call it Kinetic. I want to call it Kinetic Motion. Microsoft's Kinetic Motion. The, 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 the Microsoft products literally, like, there's kind of a one for one matching. You know, there's a fitness thing. Thing. There's a game right. thing. Um, the they're just so. It's the list of of projects is or 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 launch titles is just so similar. Um, right. I don't know. On live, what's going on with that? You said it launches tonight. So on live apparently is launching at 9 p.m. Thursday, which is today, the day we're recording this. If you're watching this live, then um, they are starting to roll out. Uh, accounts. If you've pre-registered, if you signed up for the kind of the free year deal um, that they started offering, and they're still offering today, they say at 9 p.m. Eastern right now, they are going to be getting rolling out accounts. I have no idea how quickly they're going to be rolling out accounts. If it, um, Obviously, they're not going to just turn on 20,000 accounts and see how it goes. You know, my guess is that they're kind of trying to bring it up slowly, see if or which servers decide to die, which games are dying and that kind of thing. And, and they, they seem to think 
that it's going to be working reliably, that it's that uh, it's it's all going to work as planned. Um, they were at E3 showing a lot off. I know Leo and Brian got some hands-on time with it and again, seemed very impressed. Um, there were a couple of interesting little tidbits that came up uh, from people who were kind of scouring through the, the terms of service, the TOS in it. Things mm-hmm. that might put paint it in a negative light. Uh, if, if you suspend, remember you have to pay for both the on-live service and then you mm-hmm. have to buy games. Uh, right. The games are supposedly going to be cheaper, 20 to $40. Uh, but if you suspend your account, meaning that you don't pay on live for 12 months, they have the ability to cancel it and then lose all of your purchases or coupons or data, anything like that. So, <laughs> right. you know, if you, if you are off on live for a year, if you try to go back after that, chances are your games are going to be gone. Um, that's one of the realities that comes with cloud computing that comes with digital distribution that you never really worried about before because you always had your discs, you always had, you always had your, your DVDs or CDs to install Half-Life 1. Uh, you know, six years later, that's what you wanted to do. The other thing was is that the TOS says that if the game is three years old, they have the ability to stop supporting that game and you do not get a refund after three years. If they decide to stop uh, supporting that game before the three years, they will give you kind of a prorated refund, apparently. But after mm-hmm. three years, they have the the right to just kind of, nah, you just don't have access to that anymore. And, yeah. you know, we don't know for sure that they're actually going to do these things. We don't know if they're just putting this in the terms of service to kind of cover their ass in terms of if this thing blows up or if they go under and they start losing all this money and blah, blah, blah. So we don't know if it's just in there just because their lawyer said you better do this to be safe or if they actually plan on enforcing it. But it it should bring, I think, some of the the hype about digital distribution a little bit lower where people have to start thinking about these things, about, you know, how many times have, have we heard of music services that suddenly go offline and you don't have access to that entire library that you had collected or that you had, you know, been renting from whichever one it happened to be, right? And so now that's going to be apparently happening to games in some instances, depending on what's going on. So... Gee, I mean, is this just another Steam? I, I just, I just hear this as being, a, a, or am I just completely no. not understanding it? No, it's not. It's not like Steam. So Steam, you actually download the game, install it on your computer like a normal PC mm-hmm. game installation. But the benefit is, or, or you have to be logged into Steam to play it. It's kind of a DRM system. You can download the game on as many places as you want. With OnLive, it's a streaming service. So you are essentially watching a movie of the game being rendered on a remote server. That is then right. sent over your internet connection to you uh, under supposedly very very low latency, and then you interact with that movie with your mouse and keyboard or your your controller or whatever. That information sent back to the server. Results happen. You get the results of that video back, and that kind of thing. So it's a very interesting idea. I I got some hands-on time with it before, and I wasn't super impressed. But they were saying I, that was because it was in beta, and I was too far away. And so I'm 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 interested to see what it's like now. I, I, I hope it works better than it sounds like it's going to work. <laughs> yeah, that, that's pretty much the initial reaction most people have is it's like you can't really break the laws of physics in terms of latency and how many hops you have to go through. And, you know, on live, they have a very good technical pitch for it and, and how they're, they're having server locations placed throughout uh, the, the U.S. so that you're always connecting to the one closest to you. It's always got, you know, the lowest server load and all this other kind of stuff. So it'll be it's interesting. Edge cache serving. Th- it's just, it's, it's just, it's two-way comms, edge cache. So it's just, <laughs> there's just a lot of, I, I, I hope they actually make it work. So if they do, it'll be a magnificent feat of, of right. engineering. <laughs> it's just, well, it just sounds, it's just, it just seems like a lot of points of failure or slowdown or latency for a lot. And it's video gaming. Um, yes. So first person shooters, eh, I'm still very, very skeptical about. I played Burnout Paradise, which is kind mm-hmm. of a racing game, and it was a much better experience when I tried it, you know, several months ago. One thing I did want to point out, I think when I listened to Brian talk with Tom on the Tech News Tonight show a, f- a couple days ago, at least, he mentioned that this was going to be a way for you know, you mentioned at the beginning that PC games are starting to look much, much better than console games because consoles are five years old now. I mean, and PC hardware has continued to advance. And Brian said something about, well, this will help bring those higher quality visuals to the everyday consumer that doesn't want to buy 
upgraded hardware all the time. And, and that's not exactly going to be the case because keep in mind, these games are still being rendered on hardware and they're being rendered by servers with, you know, multiple graphics chips in them and multiple processors in them and this kind of stuff. But you can't, again, we get back to, you can't break the laws of physics. <laughs> Something still has to do the computing on it. They're not going to partition enough GPU horsepower, CPU horsepower to suddenly make this game look as good as a GTX 480, for example, right? So it seems to me based on, you know, they're limiting it at 720p resolution and the image quality settings that we've seen these games running at, we're probably talking, you know, if you're lucky, we're, we're getting like a 9800 GT in terms of graphics performance that is being, because I mean, you think what they have to do, they have to take a big supercomputer that's in a rack in a, in a data center somewhere and they're not going to dedicate one to one, one machine to one user. That's going to be way too expensive to charge five ninety five a month or whatever they're whatever they're charging. So they might make that server serve ten gamers, right, or or ten instances of the same game and that kind of thing. So the GPU horsepower has to be divided up in that way. So, I mean, it's I, I'm I'm hopeful. I still I, I believe it or not, I want it to <laughs> succeed. I'm no, just, no, I've, I've, I, I, I think I, I want it to succeed. Also, I just think of like just serving video on a network is a nightmare. Right. But, you yes. know, taking, you know, all of the interactions that normally take place between your keyboard and your CPU and sending them up over the, you know, up over the net to a remote server to, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, I, yeah, I, 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 I look forward to seeing it. I, I, I hope everybody in the first round of, of testing uh, has better uh, network performance than I often do in, in my part of the world. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, Should let's we... oh, go go ahead. ahead. I was just going to say I was going to take a quick break and get to uh, today's sponsor. The episode of This Week of Computer Hardware is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks with more than 75,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including fiction, nonfiction, and periodicals. For listeners of Twitch, Audible is offering a free audiobook to give you a chance to try out the service. Um, one audiobook that you might consider as your freebie is one, I'm not sure if you've heard of this or read this. It, it is called, let me look up my name here again, You Are Not a Gadget by <laughs> Jaron Lanier. Have you read this? I have not. So it's it's a very interesting book. Uh, it's it's a couple. No, it's not exactly a couple years old. It's almost eight ten months old. But in in internet time, that's a lot. And <laughs> it's kind of a book that talks about software paradigms and how they are uh, restricting human interaction with technology because software developers have 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 made these mistakes that that are propagating through. Uh, release and release after software. It's basically telling you that the way we interact with computers and technology in general is really limiting us as humans in terms of what we're allowed to express. Think of what Twitter is doing to limiting you in terms of how you express your, your feelings or what you're doing at that exact instant. It's within 140 characters and, you know, almost a lack of pictures or video or creativity and that kind of thing. And it's just, I, I'm, I'm still getting into it. And I, I wrote out a couple of, uh, of the interesting quotes here. Just to mention, uh, he says very early on, the process of significantly changing software in a situation in which a lot of other software is dependent on it is the hardest thing to do. So it almost never happens. And so the first thing I thought when I read that is, well, that's what Windows is, right? <laughs> Windows is very difficult to change. It depends on Windows for it to function. Um, and, you know, the, uh, the, the kind of theory that the internet is creating this kind of living entity, this intelligence that you can access. And we they talk about it on all kinds of other shows all the time about how Twitter creates this, this pool of knowledge that people can tap into at any given time. Um, well, he kind of downplays that and says that it's really limiting the human kind of culture to express itself. And there, there's an instance or another quote in here where he says, Wikipedia, for instance, works on what I call the Oracle illusion in which knowledge of the human authorship of a text is suppressed in order to give the text superhuman validity. Traditional holy books work in precisely the same way and present many of the same problems. So he's kind of comparing so does the Wikipedia for the Bible. <laughs> right. right. So because we don't know who wrote each individual wiki, Wikipedia entry, 
we think of it as, you know, an always correct type of assumption. And uh, I mean, there's, there's just lots of these really cool theories in this book that, uh, that I think are, are worth looking at. You know, I, I keep thinking like every time anybody's done an audible book, like 99 times out of 100, it's like science fiction or engaging fantasy or a political thriller. <laughs> You're going for the hardcore learning, Ryan. This is serious stuff. It, and it, I'm I, not gonna lie. It, it's a tough book to listen to or to read. It's <laughs> he jumps around ideas a lot, and there's a lot. I mean, it's one of those things where you just kind of have to re-listen, re-listen, re-listen to what he said a few times because he's he's a very intelligent person, and it kind of all mashes together. Um, I'm gonna respectfully request people listen to this audible book at home or on the plane or while they're a passenger and not while they're driving. How yeah, so you don't have to hit the rewind <laughs> button on your MP3 player over and over again. That's a good idea. I, how do people get the Audible deal? Uh, so you can download this audiobook or any other book of your choice for free. All you have to do is go to audiblepodcast.com slash twitch. That's T-W-I-C-H. And uh, we thank Audible for their support. Thank you, um, Audible. So what was next in our, our list of topics here that we wanted to get to? We want to talk about iPhone 4. We kind of want to leave that to the other guys. We can leave that to the other guys. The okay. iPhone 4 is coming. Uh, Apple got, or Apple, AT&T got stomped because they're, either their <laughs> servers weren't ready or they put it in untested patch that was designed to prevent fraud across all of their servers. In any case, a lot of people, myself included, were very frustrated trying to order the next generation iPhone hardware, yes. which may or may not be waiting for me at my local Apple store on June 24th. <laughs> and if you haven't ordered one yet, you're going to get it sometime in probably the second week of July at this point. That's probably Fantastic. okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would think so, yeah. Um, so we last week we talked about routers. We had a little debate. The title of the episode was I Hate My Router or My Router Sucks, <laughs> something to that effect. Um, and we, we're, we're, we're still kind of trying to figure out how we want to test routers. And you had... We're not ready to kind of get a, give a definitive answer now, but uh, we had a couple of give, notes in about one. I can give kind somebody of, else's definitive answer. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Let let yeah, we can do that. Well, uh, uh, first of all, I'll say it's kind of interesting. Uh, I, I, on some level, maybe it's just me. I think Linksys still kind of dominates the market, or at least they dominate the shelves in anywhere left that sells computers. Um, and Linksys. Has, I should say Cisco has completely redone their lineups. They've basically taken from the Linksys all the WRT stuff, including all of the remaining WRT 54Gs, near and yep. dear to my heart that they are, are gone. <laughs> They're still in stores, but they're basically being – the stock's being sold out and they're no longer being manufactured. So they've completely redone their consumer lineups, uh, which I, 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 I do want to point out that – it is probably the least accessible website in terms of actually getting information about products that I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. Uh, and part of that is because uh, Cisco decided that they're going to have the Cisco Valet, which is their sort of entry-level consumer line, and the Linksys E-Series. And uh, it all sounds very wonderful. The Valet are all uh, uh, single single brand, uh, excuse me, single, uh, uh, single, single channel, and this is not my choice of words, so I don't know want to get any hate email or, or tweet sent to me, but mommy-friendly routers, uh, uh -huh, and they're calling okay. them hotspots and not routers. They, you know, they have hmm. 100 megabit and gigabit Ethernet versions, but essentially um, what they're basically doing is a very simple set of routers that they're not calling routers, they're calling them hotspots, right? They're the classic, like, you know, get this for your non-techie friend or relative, or this is something that, in theory, the non-techie relative is going to be attracted to. They have sort of soft softer designer colors, you bring mm -hmm. out the Death Star Black for the E-Series, but um, it's actually really kind of funny. These are all the existing lineup of routers they had, like the Valet 10 is the WRT-160N, the E3000 is the WRT-610N uh, version 2, which is the router I have at home. Um, so it, it's kind of a weird movement, like, you know, I thought that was interesting that they decided they were going to do the valet and it's a hotspot, not a router, because the idea is that a lot of people are like, I connect to the hotspot at work or the Wi-Fi at work, so I'm, I'm going to see a <laughs> Wi-Fi hotspot on the shelf and I'm going to grab that one. Yeah. On the upside, the, the uh, you know, the, the high-end stuff is pretty much still the high-end stuff, but uh, I thought it was interesting leading at Small Net Builder, um, which is kind of my go-to when I'm, when I'm 
looking at routers and, and stuff. One of the things I, I can't stand is the fact that there's still so many uh, 10 100 routers that, that not everyone has gone straight to gigabit, 10 100 gigabit on everything. Yeah, so, th yeah, I saw you point that out. That does seem kind of weird. Um, you know, and it's not that big a problem because you basically, you don't buy a gigabit hub, you buy a gigabit switch, you plug your router into the switch and you plug all your gigabit devices into the switch and that takes care of that problem because the switch will take care of the gigabit's routing because your, your internet's not going to get any faster because it's connected to, you know, unless you, you know, have internet two in your dorm room, um, right. <laughs> which I, I'm pretty sure most of us uh, or most everybody listening who's not in college and, and maybe measuring in, uh, majoring in college Sci or, or physics or something doesn't have access to. <laughs> um, and for those of you who do enjoy it and treasure it, because life after college will be very slow in terms of download. Um, but uh, it was interesting looking at uh, the sort of the top of the heap right now uh, over at Small Net Builder. They do these huge, expansive testing charts, and they look at you know throughput across multiple clients and all these different areas inside of a house. So they have an idea of how a particular router does in a you know in different basically computers at different distances from the wireless routers do, and they're calling the. Um, Netgear WNDR3700 as being uh, the Netgear's uh, WNDR3700 is kind of mm -hmm. the router right now. It it thoroughly doesn't well. It's I won't say it thoroughly spanks my 610N, but it consistently beats it. And the quote I thought was really interesting, and I I have the link there so you can put it in the show notes is. The, the WNDR3700 really can deliver 250 to 300 megabits per second mm. of aggregate aggregate wireless throughput, but think of this as a fatter pipe that can deliver higher speeds to multiple users versus a really high speed for single user HD video streaming, which is something that's okay. kind of been across a lot of routers, um, especially dual channel routers, where, where, where basically it can pass data simultaneously over two different paths, but can it, it's, it's not like there's load balancing going on there. So it's something to think about when you're looking at some of the claim speeds on the boxes from a bunch of vendors. Right. Uh, I also suggest, uh, I gotta say, if, you, if you're looking for a router, I, I really recommend their router charts that are up on there because some of the routers that are out there are fast. And some of the routers that are out there are are spectacularly poor in performance by comparison. So I think I think it's worth some time to uh, I think it's worth some time to browse through those if you're thinking about shopping. So that's my state of the union on routers right now. <laughs> state of I, the router union. State of the router union. Um, it's interesting because that that WNDR thirty seven hundred is the one I currently have. It's fairly expensive. It's like a hundred and thirty hundred forty dollar router. It has a 2.4 and a 5 gigahertz channel and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, that that was the one I had I had I had a problem with a couple of weeks ago yeah. where some machines could connect to it. So I I'm going to go back home and play with this again now because I I agree. The reason I bought this router is because it had was so highly reviewed and 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 was was known to be probably the best router that was available, the best modern in router out there. So. I, I, I got to say, I've, I've played around with a couple of different of the Linksys router, like the E3000, which is formerly the, the 610N, uh, the formerly the 610N version 2. Um, and I also, I, I got so, um, uh, I can't use that phrase on uh, on a family-friendly show like this. I got so frustrated uh, <laughs> with some of its performance in my building. I, I bought, I think, my fourth WRT54G. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd taken my yeah. old one into work to set up a network uh, that we're using for testing here. And, uh, you know, it was doing better in terms of coverage, which I, I attribute almost, I lay at the feet of the of the external antennas, which I think help a lot. And, you know, I also have a really nice, the, 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 the house I'm in is, is really difficult um, for 802.11n, especially uh, 5 mm. gigahertz. But overall, I think 802.11n, I, I welcome the performance benefits if I'm close enough to the router, but I almost want to say a lot of people are going to need to have multiple uh, hotspots inside. There's that you know marketing term there. I guess I need to go for the Cisco Valet <laughs> now. Um, are, are going to need multiple uh, hotspots inside their house to get the full end speed compared to you know. I just I just find overall I've found N to be a lot more frustrating than G in terms of you know, overall performance uh, all around the house and trying to reach into the backyard and stuff. Yeah, some people in the chat room are, are mentioning the uh, Apple um, 
Airport Extreme. And I actually, when I started asking about what routers are people using that are going to work all the time, that actually came up more than a few times as well. Um, it's it's one of the surprising. If, well, I, it isn't and isn't. I, I probably should I, I probably should like as I'm you know part of the reason I haven't done as much of of the testing as I'd like to kind of figure out a consistent methodology is because uh, my wife and I uh, just found a new apartment to move the two of us and our son into. So I've been doing a lot mm -hmm. of packing uh, and thinking about like having to move the entire network infrastructure into a new home, um, which is uh, kind of terrifying. To, to think about because there's a lot of brick in the place we're moving to, which should be even right. worse for uh, wireless propagation. Yes. But if if you look at uh, if you look at online reviews at you know Amazon.com, um, you know Netgear, not Netgear, uh, Newegg.com, places like that, the Airport Extreme consistently gets some of the the highest ratings of of any of the hmm. routers out there. Um, I've also noticed that Apple owners uh, almost universally tend to be incredibly enthusiastic about their hmm. not so inexpensive products. And the, you know, I, I'm tempted to buy one just to see if it outperforms some of the other routers out there. Yeah. So. All right. Well, that's another option as well <laughs> for everybody. Um, I I wanted to show you something that I got in. Now, I, this is this is this is brand new. Uh, this is kind of like this will be our weekly show and tell. Last week you had your uh, Drobo device. I was hoping looking for the new here. Mac Mini. <laughs> no, no, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, I guess I didn't have, I didn't get one of those. So what this is, uh, is a external touchscreen fan controller and temperature monitor. Wow. For a PC, so you can see it's it's kind of it's got a nice brushed aluminum. It's uh, it will sit on your desk, and uh, I don't have it powered up or anything yet, as you can tell. But you can see some fingerprints on it already. On the back, you've got one kind of power connection, and though I don't have it powered up, I'll show you the box as far as what it's supposed to look like. Is that? Wow. <laughs> so uh, fan speed monitoring, temperature monitoring, um, fan speed control, all in a touchscreen format. I think this, what is this called? It's the NZXT Century LXE. I don't think it comes out to the end of this month. I have no idea what it's going to, what it's going to cost. Uh, and I haven't plugged it in yet, uh, but it does come with, let's see this, this add in card for your computer. You can see that's how you get the uh, power and data connection from uh, your PC to the device Ooh, right there. And then uh, you've got five temperature, Ooh, five temperature sensors. And then you have your five fan connections as well. And so all this, you know, so your fans and everything, everything stays inside. You've just got basically one cable that will run from the back of your computer to this touchscreen fan controller. And if you, be yeah, this, this, little, exactly. this little guy right here will run to your desk, that kind of thing. We, uh, one of the guys wow. that, that, that uh, Ken, that does our, our video editing and this kind of stuff was already thinking about, I was like, I wonder if you can take this out. It doesn't, <laughs> to, to mount it in, on, you know, in a, in a couple of five and a quarter inch bays on your machine. It doesn't if, if look to be. If you have a hacksaw and a wheel, it shouldn't be that hard to do. Yeah. So it I, actually powers not, all of your fans? Yes. So it powers all of your fans through um, these connections here. You can see there is a standard kind of Molex power connector here. And then all five of the fans connect through this. And this allows it to monitor fan speeds as well as control the fan speeds. And then you can put, then you can put these sensors, these temperature sensors, you know, near the fans or technically anywhere you want, anywhere you want to monitor temperatures uh, with the, the, the device on top of your, uh, on your desk there. You know, so is this, I can see this. Go ahead. Oh, is it a is it a dedicated LCD or liquid crystal display, or can it display any kind of video over that? No, it is it is a dedicated LCD because I can see some of the framework on the screen as far as okay. what it's uh, what it is actually going to be showing you. You know, kind of like the framing and the outlining of things. I don't know if I can. Yeah, so you can see that. Totally. Some of the outlines there, but um. We're going to plug this in and play with this over the next couple of weeks and uh, see what we get out of it. I mean, it's it's obviously a niche item. Not a whole lot of people are going to need this. Overclockers <laughs> will love it. 
uh, you know, people that just, you know, fan controllers are very popular. It's just not very often. I mean, I, I guess this will technically be the first kind of touchscreen fan controller. I mean, everything else is touchscreen. I guess that should be too, right? <laughs> Why not? Everything should be. Um, so yeah, we'll have more on that in a couple of weeks once well, once we actually spend some time with it, do a review of it, tell you how much it costs and if it's if it's worth it for a user on just about any budget. Now, you did think I was going to hold up a new Mac Mini. <laughs> Not, uh, I, I don't see myself buying one. The question is, excuse me, do you find this an interesting device worth purchasing, Patrick? Okay, uh, the, the $700 price tag drops me cold. Um, in terms mm -hmm. of a com, in terms of a sort of a design and engineering exercise, I think it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, as somebody who has cracked open several devices with, you know, basically paint scrapers and popping open the sides to get into things, um, which is more of an Apple TV experience. But um, you know, yeah. I look at that and it's like. You know, it's like the coffee tub screw top on the bottom to open it up and access the memory inside of there. iFixit.com did a great breakdown, and it's a beautifully, beautifully engineered piece of hardware. There's 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 minimal components inside of it. I'm hoping that the airflow is vastly better than the Mac Mini and the Apple TV. Well, I, I literally like I, I keep looking at my Apple TV and thinking about you know taking it to the the drill press and drilling a bunch yeah. of like one inch holes in the top, but the, it's a really nice piece of engineering. It really looks good. I'm really disappointed that once again, Apple has walked away from the possibility of, of adding in Blu-ray because it does have an HDMI output. So it's kind of like, yeah, we're going to accept that people are attaching these to television. So we put an HDMI output on it. And, um, but they're, Finally. you know, yeah, but, you know, Steve hates Blu-ray, ergo, there's no Blu-ray inside of that. So I'm, I'm waiting how long it's going to be before somebody hacks a, a Blu-ray drive into that. And uh, Does and, the operating does system have the ability to play back Blu-ray? Oh, an emulation, you can do anything or <laughs> just boot Windows <laughs> 7 on it just to really tick everybody off. But yeah, um, no, okay. at, at this point, there's, there's, no, there's no mainstream... Uh, there's no easy mainstream, you know, hundred dollar package you can buy to play Blu-rays uh, through any Apple uh, Apple device. Uh, they sell Blu-ray drives for archival purposes and rendering purposes, so that hmm. you know, once you've finished your feature movie, you can, you know, burn out a Blu-ray so you can, you know, proof it before you send it to get pressed. But there is no <laughs> way to actually play Blu-ray movies, uh, <laughs> you know, directly in OS X. They just, you know, Apple does not like Blu-ray. They like iTunes, and it's near HD experience. <laughs> near HD, I'm not as sh I'm not as sure of anymore. Uh, the hardware, so the hardware inside of the of the new Mac Mini is essentially mm -hmm. not uh, almost identical to what you get inside the base MacBook. Yeah, is it the 13 inch MacBook? I guess MacBook Pro, whichever. I don't know exactly which one. Um, so you you still have a Core 2 Duo processor. You still have uh, the NVIDIA chipset, integrated graphics on it. Uh, looks like they're they even they're offering a server version that does not have any optical drive, but includes two 500 gig, 7200 RPM mobility hard drives, which is kind of interesting. But that's the model that starts at nine hundred ninety nine dollars. Yeah, so, I mean. I, 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 it does. Sorry, I'm like, uh, uh, I think it was uh, Ryan over at uh, Gadget.com was pointing out this is like, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful computer. And, and people who are like into this totally clean desk aesthetic or people who have, you know, a particular aesthetic they're trying to maintain inside their home and they want a, a home theater PC or, or they want a, you know, a, a media store, you know, and it's just, it's an experience. Expensive piece of hardware for what you're getting, you know. A Core yeah. Two Duo notebook, you know, Core Two 15 inch Core Two Duo notebook is going to run you like, you know, five hundred dollars for most places. It's not going to be as stylish. It's not going to have that particularly elegant uh, chunk right. of engineering and packaging inside of it. Um, but you know, I, I, it's it's interesting. To look at you know the, all of the announcements that have been going on at Apple. They've made huge deals out of the iPhone, the iPad. Uh, you know, they 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 basically rolled out you know the next version of Safari. They they're quietly sort of not talking about OS 10 because they're, everything's about yeah. the i operating system. Um, you know, I think in a lot of ways, Apple is is becoming a consumer electronics company more so than a, a personal computer company. 
you know, it'll be interesting to see where they are in a year from there. But, you know, the rumors that the Apple TV is getting refreshed for $100 uh, in Gadget.com was talking about, you know, basically rumors of a iOS powered $100 uh, all streaming mm-hmm. all the time uh, Apple TV box. And I just I just I see Apple TV evolving really into as somebody that's thinking more of Sony as their competitor rather than uh, Dell or, or, or Microsoft on a lot of levels. Yeah, agreed. So, um, um, so it doesn't sound like either of us are going to be buying the Mac Mini. So, oh well. <laughs> I, just, I, you know, if it was five hundred and I had a desk that was prettier, I would certainly think about it. <laughs> you it's just a lot of money. A really pretty is. computer to stack stuff on it, right? And and, and leave drink cups <laughs> next to and put papers on. Uh, yeah, I agree. You've seen my desk. <laughs> <laughs> um. Something else interesting we saw this week were some leaked benchmarks of Intel Sandy Bridge, which is their upcoming architecture that will be out probably Q1 of next year. For those of you that haven't heard of Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge is the next iteration of the Intel TikTok method of releasing processors. So this is a new architecture on a 32 nanometer process. Now what happens here in Sandy Bridge is you will get the processor functionality and the GPU functionality, Intel integrated graphics functionality merged onto a single die. So currently we have Clarksdale or Clarkdale on the for from Intel on the desktop. And that has you, you can buy a processor, it has integrated graphics on it and it has a processor, but they're on two different die in on the uh, on the same package. Right. So you've got a 32 nanometer processor and a 40 na- 45 nanometer graphics portion. So with Sandy Bridge, it is merging both of those into a single die, uh, more efficient for them to build. It should be uh, much less power hungry, uh, moving the graphics from 45 to 32. Hopefully we will be seeing a significant performance upgrade in their graphics. I mean, we're not, uh, we don't really have any kind of specific numbers on that. The benchmarks that we are seeing leaking from a, a Japanese website focus really solely on the CPU side of things, and uh, the initial results, the initial results are not really that all imp- all that impressive. But we got to keep in mind a couple of things. One, this is a really really early engineering sample. It's running at 2.5 gigahertz, which is a fairly low mm. CPU frequency compared to what we have today. Now they compared it to a Nehalem part, the currently available desktop part, running at the same 2.5 gigahertz, and the IPC the kind of instructions per clock. So basically there's two things you know about in processors. How how fast is it in terms of gigahertz and how much work can it get done on each of those ticks on each megahertz, so to speak. Um, and the amount of work that the Sandy Bridge part can do in comparison to what Nehalen can do is slightly better, but not dramatically so according to these initial results. So okay. we're, we're curious to see what will kind of answer the questions of how well will Sandy Bridge perform and how much of an improvement will we see is how much thermal space Intel has on this processor to um, increase clock speeds. Will we see clock speeds, you know, in the 3.5 gigahertz range to 3.6 up to 3.8? We've seen Intel parts today on the 32 nanometer process being able to get there fairly easily. It's whether or not they can get there in, the, in a thermal envelope that allows them to have CPU cores and GPU cores in the same chip. So it, like, it's, it's an interesting debate. I'm like looking over here, like skimming uh, uh, specs on Intel's website. It, mm-hmm. You know, it, it seems like it's a tick, not a talk, you know, incremental improvement on performance, or am I just misinterpreting um, the far too early numbers at this point? May, um, no, so it's, it should yeah, be, I don't, do know, I don't know what Do ticks come first or do talks come first? I don't, I don't. <laughs> Which are the big architectural <laughs> jumps? So the architectural jumps happen when we go, when we stay on the same process node mm-hmm. and we go to the next architecture. So we have currently, we currently have 32 nanometer processors. Sandy Bridge is a 32 nanometer processor, but a new architecture. After mm-hmm. this, after Sandy Bridge, we'll go into the next step, which will be a Sandy Bridge-like architecture shrunk down to 28 nanometers, I believe, is what is what will be next. So, I mean, we expect to be there to be some performance improvements going from Nehalem to Sandy Bridge. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, but like I said, it's it's early. You know, we don't know how finalized a lot of these specs are. A lot of it will depend on on clock speed, and maybe they're they're going to point to well, their graphics, their GPU uh, performance is increasing dramatically in that overall the processor is a much faster 
part. So it remains to be seen. Remains to be seen. More will probably, I mean, we'll hear more. Uh, Intel Developer Forum is in September in San Francisco, in your, in your neck of the woods. I'll be out there for that. And I'm sure they'll be doing some kind of number previews at that event. So we'll have an idea of what to expect then. And then probably part sampling by the end of the year and actual parts available uh, by Q1. So uh, also real quick, I do want to point people to, I just posted a review looking at GeForce GTX 480 and 470, 470 in SLI. Mm -hmm. So um, this is something that's that's fairly interesting to see. Very powerful graphics cards. You put two of them together, they're still going to be very, very powerful. I was impressed with the scaling of uh, what you get going from one card to two. We saw I saw several instances of seeing eighty plus percent scaling. Really, in gaming performance. Yeah, going with with both the four eighty and the four seventy. And what was even more impressive was a lot of this. A lot of times we were seeing this performance scaling even at you know, 1920 by 1200, which is a kind of a, you know, the mid range, it, it, it's kind of a top level resolution, but that's where I consider most of the kind of hardcore gamers that are considering a pair of GTX 470s or 480s. That's right. probably the type of monitor they will have. That um, seems like a fantastic performance improvement for, for it SLI. Is. I it mean, is. That, it's that's much, the, cause, go ahead. I was going to say, it's much better than what we have seen in the past couple of years. You know, usually if we're getting 50 to 60%, that was really, really, really good, uh, mm -hmm. say in the GTX 285 realm. But, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, we saw lots of instances where we were in the 80s. And right. even at 1680 by 1050, a, a very low resolution in my mind for, you know, a hardcore enthusiast gamers, we're still, we were seeing, you know, 50s and 60% scaling, which those typically tend to be CPU bound resolutions than, yeah right. so but but there was it was I, I saw good results pretty much across across the board here uh mm -hmm. they do use a lot of power though <laughs> um adding in the second gtx 480 added 278 watts of power consumption <gasps> to our system Youch! finally the use for the thousand watt power supply <laughs> yeah exactly i mean we went from uh, a single card Keep in mind, this is total power consumption, not just the graphics card. So uh, a high-end quad-core processor, you know, six gigs of memory, one hard drive, uh, 448 watts with a single card at mm -hmm. peak kind of uh, gaming load. And then it went up to 726 watts with two cards. Do not so, buy a cheap power supply. Do not buy a cheap power supply. Yeah, I, I was actually asking in, uh, NVIDIA when I was finishing up this article, I was like, what are your recommendations for power supplies here? Because that's pretty steep. Uh, and if you go to, I forget which one of their websites it is, uh, in slizone.com, I believe, you'll see like, rec you, you know, you say, well, I'm going to run two GTX 480s. Here's a list of recommended or approved power supplies. And I looked through it and there was nothing under 900 watts on that list. Mm -hmm. uh, and they even had an option for if you're running three GeForce GTX 480s. And I think there were two power supplies. On that yeah, list, I, I want to see that. I want to see you guys run the 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 triple GTX 480 next. That would be kind of fun. Um, <laughs> we've we've done, a, yeah. We, I, I don't, I, I, I'm, I can probably put a third one on there. I, I can do on, that, dude. We're doing. <laughs> what if you uh, get another eighty percent performance. <laughs> and that would be never impressive. Leave the house again. <laughs> not, not a lot of games would need it. That was one of the things that's interesting. Is there are some games that. One card is more than enough performance right. to get, you know, more than 60 frames per second. But a lot of games, uh, Metro 2033, which is kind of like mm -hmm. the new crisis in terms right. of it's just bogging it down. So even at, um, you know, a single GTX 480 runs that at about 50 frames per second at 1920 by 1200 minimums of 37. So there's room for improvement there, right. uh, even with the SLI. So... You know, triple 480s is for, you know, the people with the 30-inch or multiple 30-inch monitors. <laughs> yes, yes, multiple 30-inch monitors. And that's actually something that uh, will be coming out probably by the end of this month is their NVIDIA Surround, their answer to mm -hmm. Ifinity, multi-monitor gaming and that kind of stuff. And then if you get into 3D Vision Surround, so let's see, what is it? So it's if you have three 1080p monitors, you're 5760 by 1080. Right. And then... <laughs> If you do it in 3D, you have to render twice as many frames per second 
as you would. So you're doubling up the pixels again. So there are ways to use this kind of horsepower. And trust me, we're going to try to find ways to, uh, to utilize all of it. You know, that was, that was one of the fun, some fun things we did in the AT Nation this week around E3. It was like listing all of the games we thought would make the best eye candy on a on a giant HD TV. Um. <laughs> and what, what did you come up with? Was Metro 2033 on that list, or what else did you have on there? I don't know if Metro 23. It was a long list. I just HD yeah. Nation TV. I'm I'm not going to try to recount it off my head because I'll completely mess it up. I was just I was it was interesting watching people react and not react like the 3DS. You know, I think people are a lot more excited about 3D gaming on the 3DS and a handhold, de- uh, handhold, a handheld device with no goggles than they are no compared goggles. to 3D gaming on the living room through an HD TV or, or, or you know, at their desktop with a set of goggles. People really hate the goggles. I think gamers, yeah. I think, are gamers, I think, are, are certainly a little more uh, amenable to them on some level, but. I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the it's one of those technologies that you really have to see. There was a quote I saw Nvidia Nvidia pushing the 3D technology to me. They showed me a quote from a game developer, a well known game developer that I, who I can't remember which one it was at this point, but he mm-hmm. said something to the effect of trying to describe 3D technology to somebody who hasn't seen it is like trying to describe color to a blind person. Um, I don't know if I could go quite that far. But uh, it was an interesting analogy in terms of you have to see it to decide if you think it's worth wearing glasses <laughs> and that type right. of thing. So well, um, it works well if you want to make sure everybody tries your technology before they decide not to buy it <laughs> or to embrace it <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a must have for the gaming experience. Yeah, it's funny seeing like marketing material for 3D TVs and 3D games and this kind of stuff because you can't you can't show it. Right. I mean, right. you look at the Samsung TV commercials that are out there now and it's, you know, Somebody taking a, a, a the a immersive free- television experience end users have waited for their entire television watching career. 3D HD TV brings you inside the story, the game, the movie like you've never imagined. Yeah, you mean that kind of stuff? Yeah. <laughs> it also reminds me of uh, when you see TV, just uh, TV commercials in general, where they show you these really bright, colorful images, and they're like, "See how great." The images look on our TV, and I'm like, well, if I'm watching it on my TV and I see it just fine, that doesn't prove your point at all. Um, let's go into we've got we got quite a few Twitter questions. We'll see how many we get through, but I did get an email that uh, I wanted to read from a, a viewer, a listener, Michael Wilson, and he has a question about 1080p streaming to his TV, and he references a previous hack you had done. So I figured this was. Right up our alley. I think we kind of talked about it a little bit. It says, uh, thank you guys for all the shows and information you put out there. My question, I want to stream 1080p media from my computer to my TV. Watch YouTube on the TV and play visualizations during music playback. I got excited after watching Patrick's Apple TV hack with ATV Flash and tried that out. Since the Apple TV is limited to 720p, I also added the new Broadcom Crystal HD video card to the Apple TV so that I could play 1080p content. However, the setup has turned out to be too buggy for me. Now I think I want some small netbook type device with XBMC. However, my TV uses component video only. And I think small netbook computers all use HDMI. Can Ion and Atom stream stream 1080p content? Or is there some device with component video that can stream as many codecs as XBMC, plays YouTube, plays visualizations during audio playback? Okay. Um... The in sort of descending order, I'd say uh, I think the the, the Broadcom acceleration uh, with X uh, basically Broadcom Crystal DD is a mini PCI Express card um, that is an option from some vendors inside of netbooks or, or uh, eBox type small low power consumption uh, atom based PCs. Um, YouTube on the TV is easy. 1080p media varies depending on the platform. Uh, you're gonna, I would highly recommend either uh, if you're doing a home theater PC to, type device and you really want the low power, uh, at the very least, uh, an Atom uh, uh, with the NVIDIA ION chipset for graphics, um, which still, I think, has a little trouble with Hulu uh, and will continue mm. to until uh, some of the flash drivers get rooted out a little bit better. I'm, I'm hoping that flash acceleration on uh, NVIDIA ION and the Broadcom cards and some of the other stuff continues to get better between now and the end of the year because flash acceleration uh, has has obviously not existed. It's just been released to the public after being in right. beta for a while. And what's interesting about, what's frustrating 
frustrating about flash acceleration is is there's you know inside of a you know you load a flash movie you may not really think about it but the the that flash player is essentially a container and traditionally first there were, you could only host flash you know adobe's flash formatted video flv video inside of that and then later on uh, they decided to do like h.264 type video inside of that or and and despite the fact that you may have had the ability to accelerate the h.264 playback you couldn't reach through the flash player to do the hardware acceleration so they're fixing that they finally accepted that but uh, you know will a, will a, you know an atom uh, an atom processor play 1080p video no if it has the nvidia ion chipset coupled up with it yes will it do blu-ray playback yes will it do full screen hulu playback kind of not as well the flash <laughs> stuff can still be problematic right the boxy box which was supposed to come out q2 which is boxy box by d-link which is the direct it's strange little shaped but you know decidedly uh uh, uh compelling set-top box uh, mm -hmm. built by dealing from boxy using nvidia's uh uh what's it Tegra chipset yeah, yeah. Um, they basically have delayed it till november uh, i think a in hopes to get it into you know the, the the holiday shopping season but b because they're really having issues with 1080p full screen video playback there's just a lot of data to move across there yeah um i would you know I prefer a Core 2 Duo and a decent graphics chipset, ideally for a home theater PC. Mm -hmm. um, for dedicated devices, um, I think the Popcorn Hour is a really good Popcorn Hour basically makes, uh, they're going to do the Siabas makes Popcorn Hour, which are some dedicated um, uh, set top boxes. Uh, Western Digital's uh, WT. WDTV. I was going to say WDTV Live. The WDTV was mm. originally a hard drive based player, the live ads and the Ethernet port and the ability to stream content. Right. Um, those are my two favorites right now. Robert Heron spent a lot of time with those. Uh, it's also worth looking at, um, if you don't have a Blu ray player, it's also worth looking at a lot of the new Blu ray players, which are, are integrating uh, Amazon Video on Demand, Netflix Video on Demand, um, some of the other stuff. Um, because they they offer kind of like a single box package that can deal with a lot of streaming media depending on which one you go with but um, you know I, I would I would start with the popcorn hour the WDTV live and maybe something a little more power powerful than a, than an Atom Nvidia Ion um, uh, uh, home theater PC because I think Windows Media Center is an awesome way to play back content and, and basically pretty much does everything on Michael's list. Um, and the hardware acceleration is pretty much uh, a given. It's easy on that one. Mm -hmm. um, just whether or not it's it's as, as low power as he may want is, is kind of the big question on that one. Did I hit all the points on that one? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you did. I think you went through the list of questions right, right through them. Um, yeah, cool. that's interesting. I mean, it's always better to have more power than less. I think the yeah. delay of the boxy box is kind of indicative of a lot of these kind of... Uh, it was promised to do everything, maybe didn't quite deliver... As, as much as they'd wanted to, so. Yeah, I, I, I got to say, like, you know, because one of the things Michael said is, like, I want a small netbook-type device with XBMC, uh, which is great until you start hammering up against 1080p video playback and the lack of, of uh, component output. Um, but I would let somebody else buy the X, the, 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 the the, <laughs> I can't say that word, netbook type device, and you know, let them prove to you that it's doing a good job with 1080p playback and all the formats you want. Um, because I've 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 been I've been really frustrated. Just because it has an HDMI port doesn't mean it does a very good job actually playing uh, full 1080p video. All right. Now let's go into let's run through these Twitter questions here. Um, Let's see. First one is from Rogers, who says, uh, at Ryan Trout. By the way, before we get into these, uh, if you're not following <laughs> Patrick Norton, at Patrick Norton or at Ryan Trout, that is how you get the notice that we are fielding Twitter questions for uh, this week in computer hardware. So you should definitely do so there. Now back to the question. Rogers asks, <laughs> he's, uh, he says he's buying 30 new Dell Latitude E6510 notebooks for work. Should he go with the Core i7-620M or the Core i7-720M or 720QM for best performance? Ooh, um, 620M. <laughs> you're Sorry. buying 30 of them. I say you buy 15 of each. Mm -hmm. So the, I don't think it's going to make a big enough difference for it to really matter depending on what exactly 
you're doing. Um, try and remember the exact specs of the 720 QM. So the Q just stands for uh, lower power, right? So it's it's a lower wattage. The, the 720 720 QM is six megabytes of smart. Ca I actually got kind of fascinated by this question because because I I live in I've pretty much lived in notebooks my entire adult life. Yeah. 720 Q 720 is uh, six megabytes of smart cache, clock speed of 1.6 gigahertz. It's 45 watt part, mm -hmm. uh, DDR3 memory, and it has four cards. The 620M, excuse me, four core cores, not cores, cards. I'm cores, still obsessed yeah, okay. with the GTX 480, uh, <laughs> doubling and tripling. Uh, the 620M is four megabytes of cache. Uh, 2.66 gigahertz clock speed, 35 Ooh, okay. watts, and uh, two cores. So the uh, the big, mm -hmm. the, I think. Uh, the and the 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 scaling the performance scaling on uh, the speed step I think actually looks a little more compelling on the 620m. Uh, it's got more cache. Uh, the, the 720 has more cache, which may be helpful. But I think once you've got four megabytes of cache, you're probably doing pretty good. I don't think six yeah. meg is going to offer you a huge uh, boost. Um, but uh, yeah, unless you run a ton of multi-threaded applications or a ton of applications simultaneously that actually put any kind of demand on the processor, I would almost say go for the 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 two-core part. Yeah, um, <laughs> agree. You know. that, that's now now that you spell the specs out, that makes a lot of sense. So there you go. Enjoy your thirty new laptops, or enjoy servicing <laughs> and giving out your thirty new laptops. Yeah. Oh, and the the this turbo boost on the six twenty M goes up to like. 3.33 versus 2.8. And it's also, you know, megahertz isn't necessarily equatable. It's not a one-to-one -one equation with the actual amount of work performed. But I think the 620M sure. is the more compelling out of those two parts. I All hope right. you guys aren't video editing, in which case uh, I would say go for the quad-core part. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What is our uh, next question here? Mill Group at Ryan Shroud is getting a Microsoft TechNet subscription okay and legal for regular users with multiple PCs. And which subscription do you recommend? So I have no idea uh, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it's illegal. I, I would guess that it's against some kind of, uh, not terms of service, but uh, what's the some other term? Fine EULA. Print. EULA, yeah. yeah. Um, it's probably against it for regular users. The idea of a TechNet is that a professional user has the ability to test software on different types of hardware before they go and buy said software. That being said, I have a TechNet subscription that I use, but I use it for all of our test systems. So I have a copy of Windows 7 that is legal and, and activated and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I'm not going to tell you that I don't also use it for other machines that are under <laughs> personal use. So... You know, it's as for which sub do I recommend? I don't know enough about them to recommend one. But yeah. if if you can justify it in any way, if you're kind of do IT support for any kind of small company or something like that, it might be worth it because you get you get access to a whole lot of Microsoft software for like four hundred dollars a year, type of thing. So it's I I, I would hi, if you if you are super geek and you want to see the latest coolest stuff without having to you know download a potentially root kitted version of it off of insert yeah. your favorite peer to peer service here um, <laughs> uh, I would I would go for Microsoft Technet My, Microsoft wants to use this to distribute enthusiasm about Microsoft products the Microsoft police are not going to kick in your door looking for your certified right. I am a technical dude certificate because uh, there isn't one uh, you know pay your money. You know, don't pirate the stuff and, and enjoy it. Uh, I, I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. I think really this is what they should yeah. be doing in general for the consumer. You pay yes. $300 a year. You can download Office. You can download Windows 7. Uh, you want to try out SQL Server for some odd reason? Hey, go for it. You got your, <laughs> right? There's so, somebody out there who just squeed with joy at the thought of having a, their own personal SQL Server run up that way. Yeah, have fun with that. Uh, let's see. Next one, Dan. <laughs> Truter asks uh, Patrick Norton and Ryan Trout, the retractable coaster on my PC doesn't eject anymore. Where should I set my coffee cup? <laughs> my answer well, is always on top of the monitor. That's a good spot for it. On top of the monitor, uh, over by the back of the case where the power supply is, uh, or hmm. go to your local auto or boating supply house and buy yourself one of those cool guy uh, screw into the side of your boat or truck uh, drink holders. <laughs> <laughs> I like the I idea enough, of putting one it on my very... desk right now. <laughs> nice. 
I like the idea of putting it on top of an LCD monitor. Like CRT monitor, that's too easy. You know, now you got the thin bezel LCD monitor. You got to, you know, that's, I think, the best place for it. Yeah, the, uh, uh, it, it, uh, maybe that's a yeah. little bit too thin. The, the MacBooks are a little yeah, mounted well, on yeah. the top. Okay, it's easy on the <laughs> Lenovo. <laughs> yeah, see? That's a perfect spot for your drink. I like it. You don't need, you don't need that retractable coaster anymore. There you go. <laughs> uh, our next one comes from Yu Sharo, who says, Just have to know, have you gotten your on-live invite all set for tonight? I have gotten mine. I have logged into it, and it says, please wait longer. So uh, either they know it's me and they're not going to let me on anyway. Uh, but I'm planning on trying it tonight and probably trying it tomorrow, maybe doing a little bit of a write-up tomorrow, depending on how much time I get to play with it. Have you signed up for it at all yet, Patrick? I actually, I think I signed up for the first time we talked about this. I'm checking my okay. email right now, and there is I'm probably like the 2,473rd person in line. I'm not. Uh, I'm not holding my breath on on me getting an on live invite anytime soon. <laughs> oh well, hey, they're they're eventually going to charge you, so they want you to sign up. That's for sure. Uh, who we got? What do we got here next? Anything? Anything about coasters again? Uh, where did it go? Oh, uh, DB DBNM. Yeah. Do you know any good gaming laptops with USB 3.0? I don't know any laptops with USB 3.0 off the top of my head. I know of one off the top of my head, and I actually, I meant to bring it in the room with me. I have it. Uh, we're doing a, a review of it. It is an Asus N61J. It is has USB 3.0. It has one USB 3.0 port. It is an mm -hmm. Optimus notebook. It is a Core i5 something processor, and it has uh, mediocre, above average graphics in it. And it has Optimus, so you have the benefits of higher performance when you need it and better battery life when you don't. Right. Um, I don't know if I would consider it a gaming laptop. It's, it's, a, it's a large screen, uh, I want to say 15.6 inches. It's got a, a number pad on it. You know, I mean, it's, it's a nice laptop. I, I took it to Taiwan. I used it for all of our video editing and that kind of stuff. It was fast. Um, it, but I didn't really play a whole lot of games on it yet, and I don't have the benchmarks sitting in front of me. But in terms, if USB 3.0 is really important for you, it really limits your options right now. I think I know of maybe one or two other machines uh, that have I mean, HP is USB 3.0 uh, notebooks. Um, uh, boy, there's a there's a brain in here trying to get it. HP does, Dell does. Um, I'm actually checking okay. Alienware right now to see if I can find USB 3.0 listed on hmm. any of their... Somebody in the chat says the uh, HP NV15 has USB 3.0 right. and has a Core i7 processor. So that's another, another option as well. So it seems like they're picking up a lot more than maybe we thought. So that's good. I, I'm a big proponent of USB 3.0. I still want that everywhere like now. Um, you sold I need somebody... me on it. I'm actually looking forward to get a, an adapter into my uh, main desktop. Look for the Asus U3S6 card. It'll give you SATA 6 and USB 3.0. Um, that's a good option. I actually, uh, I got in a Sharkoon double, double bay external USB or external USB 3.0 hard drive dock. It will support two hard drives. I got that in the other day. Uh, I really want a memory card reader. I really want like an SD card and a compact flash card reader that would make getting the four gigabyte files off my Canon 7D a much quicker process. That would be nice. And like 15 megabytes a second. That's really painful. Um, but yeah. Uh, next question comes from Jack Naimi, who says, uh, what does hard drive cache do? Does it increase performance? Is 8 megs good, or should I go with 32 megs? Ooh, 30, I would almost say 32 or 16. Um, 8 megabytes of cache on a hard drive is, a, is probably a fairly old, a long-in-the-tooth drive at this point. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> The cache is used to store information locally on the hard drive. Basically, the you know the the, the spinning media is is extremely slow. Uh, it's the equivalent to having like water in a pitcher on your your kitchen counter versus having to run to the well down in the middle of town to go get your water. Um, the, the well in the <laughs> middle like of that. town, of course, being the rotating media inside your drive. The pitcher on your counter being the cache. 
um, and, and and the glass in your hand is actually the you know the the, the cache memory on the CPU. Um, mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm a big fan of like you know assuming the 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 algorithms are written properly for the drive and and generally speaking anybody making hard drives is doing a good job with their algorithms. I'm going to say if I'm looking at a 16 versus a 32 gigabyte drive, I'm probably going to lean towards 32 gigabytes. Um, you know, I, are are you going to notice a difference between 16 and 32 gigabytes of cache on a on a one terabyte or two terabyte drive? Probably not. Um, between an eight and a 16 or 32, uh, I want to say possibly, but I do not have any benchmarks in my hands to back it's, that. I mean, essentially, more is better. Right. Cash, more cash is better. Um, and I think, I mean, it, it's there, as far as I can tell, you can't buy the same series of hard drive. One has 16, one has 32. It's, there's, there's some point where the hard drive manufacturer just starts saying, okay, now we're going to make them with 32 megs of cache um, <laughs> because memory is cheaper and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you're choosing between 8 or 32, definitely go 32. And as far as what cache actually does, I like the water analogy. I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> bigger buckets closer to the house <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's like having eight pitchers that you take to the well and back versus 32 pitchers exactly or preferably yeah. having someone else carry those pitchers for you <laughs> do you want to talk about modern gaming on a 24 inch screen or recommendations for a video card for flight sim uh, we can do both let's say okay. uh, a modern card for flight sim x is not a particularly graphically intense game. Uh, under two hundred fifty dollars, I say if you get a Radeon fifty seven seventy or maybe even a fifty eight thirty, is a mm-hmm. really really good card for two fifty or under, and it's gonna. I think you'll be able to max out every setting on Flight Simulator X on a single monitor without a problem. And then uh, on the twenty four inch screen, I would go with the same thing. He says. If he has a 24 inch, should he go to 5770? Is that good enough, or should he spend the extra on 5850? Um, I think the 5850 is probably is good. Is obviously better. 24 inch screen. We're talking 1080p resolution, maybe 19 by 12. You look. I mean, go look at some of our benchmarks that we've posted recently at PCPer.com, and you'll see games like Metro 2033 are <laughs> hitting these cards hard. And mm-hmm. um, you know, it's all if you can afford it inside your budget for a one thousand dollars system. I would say the fifty eight fifty is is gonna is, is gonna give you twenty thirty forty percent more performance in that and regard. That's, so. that's a big for compared to what the the the, the vig over the the less uh, a somewhat less perf- excuse me. A, 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 you're you know you you're gonna save fifty bucks and you're gonna want to upgrade your card in like a year versus saving you know right. not saving fifty bucks and wanting to upgrade your card um, in six months. <laughs> right. <laughs> or not, right. Sorry, right. Sorry. Not wanting to upgrade your card in two years. I find graphics cards yeah. really frustrating because you know. Wait six months and you're going to get much better performance for, you know, the, the performance you're buying the now is going price. to cost half as much in six months or a year yep. or much yep. better performance for the same price. So uh, I tend to buy as much graphics as I can afford unless I'm building a $500 PC, in which case I, I buy the cheapest card I can get away with. And then I wait a year to upgrade it for something that's usually vastly faster on games. Um, <laughs> you know, it's it's a little... Yep. Yeah, I would say go for the faster card. Um, you know, so your your one K because a thousand dollars is enough money where you 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 want the graphics performance to stretch out for a couple of years rather than being super frustrated by the time all the new games announced at E three come out in in Christmas time. <laughs> Very good point. Uh, our last question comes from hmm, Argilio Corrado. Uh, says question for Twitch: How long before SSDs completely replace hard disk drives uh five years or never um i tend to side on the never but yeah i I think you're right on the never i i think um i think ssds are going to scale fast enough where in two or three years they're going to be in the majority of notebooks and Mm -hmm. maybe paired up with a secondary drive and medium to expensive uh pre-built systems um, you know, hard disk drives are always going to be, uh, barring some really massive leaps in aerial density on memory chips, I think hard right. disk drives are going to be considerably larger and considerably cheaper uh, for a considerably longer time than SSD drives are. Um, yep. You know, if they if they shrink the dies far enough and and it's stuff enough memory onto a chip, 
Um, I think he might start to get something that resembles parity, but I think at least for the foreseeable future, the, the SSD technology is going to be vastly more expensive. You know, one terabyte of, of solid state disk drive is ridiculously expensive. And for most of the things people are doing, uh, which is like, you know, opening up Word documents or, or cache for their browser or streaming movies or playing back music or, or editing Excel spreadsheets, it's a ridiculous amount of performance. Um, it's great for running your operating system. It's great for running, you know, because um, it's like, oh, SSD is going to make my video games faster. No, it may make the levels load faster. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, once you finish this level and move on to the next one, um, you know, it, it, it'll help with, you know, video editing when you're dealing with large scratch files, and large file sizes that, that bump outside of your main system memory. It's going to help with opening up large files. It's going to help with, you know, the, the performance, uh, the speed of backups, which is something you may consider when you're thinking about backing mm -hmm. up, you know. Uh, you know, hundreds of gigabytes, if not terabytes of data. Um, but terabytes of data is going to be prohibitively expensive um, <laughs> to put on solid state disk drives for a long, long time. Um, you know, so they, the short answer is SSDs are not going to replace hard drives or rotating media until there's a parity in price. Uh, if, if there's yep. parity in price and they cost the same, then the SSDs start to look really, really attractive for a lot of reasons because they fail less due to physical breakage. So, uh, and the lifespan well on put. SSDs is, we actually did a whole segment on this week's Techzilla huh. talking about, people are like, there's, there's only a million rights. No, because the math, there's the... The math for the way rights are distributed on SSDs means like you're, you're not just going to have your MLC cell flashing on and off 10,000 times and it's erased, right? Because you don't sure. constantly write to the same cell over and over again, in which case you could probably yep. wipe it out in a couple days. You you do a relatively small amount of data and it gets, for most people, they write a relatively small amount of data and the the, the SSD logic is intelligent enough to spread that around. They do load or wear leveling across different sections of the drive. So I think yep. the when Intel decided that they they sorry I've just, I've been kind of fascinated by this. Go go watch this week's Techzilla if you want to hear about where leveling and how long where, your solid state drive should last. <laughs> yeah, where where leveling is good and trust me uh at at at, at our, our storage guy Alan who probably people who listen to the show know who he is. I mean, he he'd be he'd be the first one to tell you or to let us know if something was going wrong with these drives cuz nobody does more writing and crap to them than anybody I know than he does. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's going to round out our show for the week. Um, Patrick, I know we can find you on Twitter at Patrick Norton. And also, we uh, find you at Techzilla and HD Nation. And what are the URLs for those shows again? Uh, Revision3.com slash HD Nation or Revision3.com slash Techzilla or Techzilla.com or HDNation.tv if you want the shorter thing to type in. <laughs> Or you can just subscribe to the RSS feeds and they'll show up on your on your desktop every week. <laughs> That's always you, ideal, as you should be doing for this show, um, twit.tv slash twitch. We have both audio and video versions available. If uh, you want to see when we do our fancy show and tell of touchscreen fan controllers and that kind of stuff, definitely make sure you're getting a video version as well as audio for when you're on the go. Uh, you can find me at PC Perspective, PC Per dot com we do a lot of hardware news and reviews and uh, that's where you can check out some of the stuff we talk about here uh, the sandy bridge performance numbers the gtx 480 and 470 sli testing and that type of thing and then also i am at ryan shroud on twitter and uh, when it's not fail whaling that's where you can send me questions <laughs> and that kind of stuff as i was looking for responses through twitter during the recording of the show, I got that whale several times. So thank you to the World Cup and the Game 7 of uh, Lakers and Celtics, which I will be going to watch after this. So I, I had a couple of people tweet back and be like, you fools, it's Game 7. And I'm like, basketball? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I got, yeah, we got, we got several of those. So uh, thank you guys for watching. We will see you next week with more hardware goodness. 